This is going to be the last part of this series about Christians and end times. I thought it was going to go a few more, but I think I'll close it with this one. I put several different topics together in this one. That way we could <clears throat> not stay too bogged down on it. And this one's going to be about how we're going to be changed, caught up, and crowned. So, as we talked about last time, we're in the last days of the church age. And many saints are living for the Lord, but many more are in a latter days. They're latter days saints. They're just dazed and confused. But this video is going to show what's coming for the Christian. Before all hell breaks loose on earth, the body of Christ is going to be changed and caught up to be with the Lord. While hell is breaking loose on earth, church age saints will be receiving crowns at the judgment seat of Christ. But the first thing we're going to talk about is, what's in your future? A change. You're going to be changed. In 1 Corinthians 15.50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. See, one of the best places you want to go to to uh, talk about the rapture is 1 Corinthians 15. And it great, gives a good description of what's going to happen to us. But it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So this is the reason that a lot of preachers and people say that at the rapture, your flesh and blood get left behind along with your clothes, your false teeth, reading glasses, nose rings, and wherever else you guys put rings. You know, I don't even want to know. But all that stuff gets left behind and it's going to be mass hysteria. Confusion, breaking news, and a lot of fake news about what actually happened. And it always fascinates me how some guys teach that the rapture taking place won't be a big deal to the world because there's just not enough Christians that would leave such an impact on the world. There's just too few Christians. I don't believe that. I think that's just really underestimating the entire event. And that may sound like good preaching sometimes, but it makes no sense because right now the world goes crazy over one missing person many times. I remember how recently the the young girl Gabby Petito, whatever her name was, her and her boyfriend went missing. The world went crazy about it. It was all over everything. Imagine, okay, you want to say that there's not very many Christians? Imagine it's just a million. I think it's more than that. But imagine just a million people just go missing, just out of this country. And not to mention all the kids are going to go missing. The kids that haven't reached the age of accountability, I believe that they will be raptured out as well. So this is going to be the biggest breaking news event in history. I mean, it's just going to be all over everything for months and months and months. Uh, I, I believe that people will be trying to figure out and have their theories about what happened to these people. Obviously, I mean, it's going to be their family, their friends, their co-workers. Everybody uh, is going to be going crazy. But it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So at the rapture, you know... You're going to be doing your regular business, doing what you're doing. You're occupying till he comes. And then you're going to be changed. It's going to happen just really fast. It says, I heard, uh, you know, I heard a preacher say once that this is a great verse for the nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Think about that for a minute. Maybe you'll get it. But don't be confused by we shall not all sleep. You know, when it says we shall not all sleep, that means we won't all be dead when this happens. Sleep in the Bible is also death. There are dead saints and living saints when the rapture happens. But we're all going to be changed if you're saved. And this smacks all you perfect Christians right in the face. Because if you're so great and you're so perfect and grand and holy, then why do you need a new body? Because your body still wants to sin. That's why. But it says in verse 52, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. 
So you may be in bed, you may be at work, you may be just doing your regular thing throughout the day. And then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall send sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So this change to our body is going to take place in a moment. And as fast as the twinkling of an eye. This will happen at the last Trump. And no, this doesn't mean Trump's coming back as president at the rapture. A Trump is just a sound made by a trumpet. And this is the last sound made by a trumpet. And don't confuse it with the seventh trumpet in Revelation. A lot of people do that. And it causes them to get the timing of the rapture off. But a lot of guys are teaching that we're already in the tribulation because there's these trumpets being heard all around the world. And you can go to YouTube, type that in, type in trumpets being heard all around the world. And it's pretty spooky sounding, but we're not in the tribulation. And at this last trump, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Then the, the dead saints will get up out of the grave and their soul that comes from heaven with the Lord, will meet their body. And you see the zombie movies, they're on to something, but they got it twisted. The ones getting out of the graves here are the good guys. And they're going to have complete victory over death. I'm not going to have to worry about death at the rapture. If I'm alive, I'll never have to die. If you're alive, you'll never have to die if you get raptured out. And the dead saints that are already dead, they're not going to have to worry about dying again. They're getting a new body. It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The dead that was corruptible puts on incorruption. They get a body that's never going to die. Those who are alive and remain will no longer be mortals, but we're going to be immortal. We're going to put on immortality. And you hear a lot about the word immortal on a lot of fantasy shows and movies. I think there's some type of TV show or movie called immortals even I, i'm don't quote me on that but it, i just remember hearing it somewhere and you hear a lot about that in the fantasy stuff they want to make you think something like this is a fantasy but it's not it's going to be a reality it's going to be your reality they got all this stuff like avatar and things like that you know all that's just a, a cheap little copycat of what's to come. It's not going to be fantasy. It's going to be the real thing. You're going to be putting on a body that's going to be able to do amazing things that's going to live forever. It says in verse 54, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Just like Jesus Christ defeated death out on the grave, you defeat it as well through him. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to be changed. That's in your future. That's in my future. If you're born again, if you're saved, you're going to be changed. And at this moment that 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about, I'm going to be changed forever. So if I'm going to be changed, what will the new body be like? Well, in Philippians 3.20, it says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Once again, smacking the perfect Christian in the face. You're not perfect. You've got a vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, who? The Lord Jesus Christ, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So Jesus Christ is going to give me a body like his glorious body. Well, what is his glorified body like? Well, you're, you no longer have to struggle with sin. And in Romans 8.23, it says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. You see, I'm already redeemed. I'm a new creature. 
Now I'm just waiting on my body to become new. And then I'm not going to have to worry about sin anymore. Uh, you no longer have to worry about a diet anymore. You're not going to be too fat or too skinny. You'll be just right. You won't have to worry about fitting into those jeans and sweaters that you, in your wardrobe from last year. You're going to have a new wardrobe. And the Bible talks about that in Revelation 19, 14. It says, And the armies which, in, which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So that's you. You're going to be, at, that's at the second coming. At the second coming, you come back, you're in clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So don't worry about staining your new clothes at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, the ketchup stains are going to come out. The barbecue sauce is going to come out. The coffee's going to come out. Uh, you're going to have a whole new set of clothes. Revelation 19.13 says Jesus Christ is clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. Remember, this is Jesus in his glorious body. He's not worrying about no stains getting on his clothes. We're going to have a body like his. We're going to have clothes like his. There's no need to worry about getting stains on your clothes. We get the same clothes that he's got. And he's coming down for the purpose of staining all his raiment. I mean, the second coming is going to be messy. Now, this ain't the rapture when he comes back to get us. This is the second coming when he comes back with us. And he's coming down to get his raiment stained. And he's not worried about it. It's, it says in Isaiah 63, 3, I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Of the people, there was none with him. They were all gathered together against him, except for the army behind him. And we're coming back in fine linen, white and clean. And he's coming back in white, but he's going to stain all of his raiment. In another place in Isaiah, it says, Who is he which cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? You know, he's going to get blood splatters all over that raiment. In Revelation 1, we also see a great description of Jesus Christ and his glorified body. Letting us know, giving us an idea of what our glorified body could possibly look like. In Revelation 1.14, it says, His head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. I don't know if we're going to have white hair and flaming eyes and feet like unto fine brass like Jesus does, but it does say our body will be like his. It says, Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body. His countenance shines. And I'd say ours, ours is going to as well. I mean, Moses' face even shined in his natural body. You know, while I think our body, it's going to be, it will be like his glorious body, I think we're still going to have our own unique look and personalities, which will be like ours today, minus the sin. Minus the imperfections. In 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 42, it says there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. One star differeth from another star in glory. And if the Lord made all of our fingerprints unique, and he made all the lines on our hands unique, and he made our faces, for the most part, unique, you know, sometimes you can find somebody that looks like somebody else, sometimes you see twins, but for the most part, you know who somebody is just by looking at their face. You know, we all differ from one another. And then, uh, you know, how do they identify people? Fingerprints. You know, nobody's got the same fingerprints. They say two snowflakes aren't the same. It was God that did that. It says in Job 37, 7, He sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. You know, he seals up the hand of every man. It's God that put those lines on your palms. 
It's God that sealed up those, that your fingerprints on your fingers. He made the stars differ. He makes people differ. So it makes sense that each one of us would still have differences in personalities, kind of like the one you currently have minus the sin, because that's usually how God does things. He makes things different. He gives a variety to make things, you know, not so boring. So what are some things the Lord's glorified body was able to do? I mean, anything. I mean, he's God. But what are some things that, you know, he, he showed that he could do in the scriptures themselves in his glorified body? Well, the first thing was he walked through solid objects, and if our body's going to be like his glorious body, we're going to be able to walk through solid objects. And, you know, if you, if you go to work talking about this, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. And uh, to this world, we are crazy. We're a peculiar people. But in Job 20, 20, or John 20.26, 20, it says, And after eight days again his disciples were within... And Thomas with them, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So the doors were shut. Jesus went right through them and stood in the midst. He walked, he walked through solid objects. In his glorified body, he ate physical food just for the fun of it. Because it wasn't to keep himself going. In Luke 24, 30, it says, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And in the next verse, he vanished. It says in Luke 24, 31, And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. So he's able to eat physical food with them. And he does. He appears and disappears. He just vanishes out of their sight so in your glorified body you're going to be able to do that stuff you know a lot of people ask will we eat in heaven well yeah you got the marriage supper of the lamb you've already got your glorified body at that point and you know what about flying and will we have wings i don't believe we'll have wings but i believe we'll be able to fly gabriel doesn't have wings Never says Gabriel has wings and he flies in Daniel 9.21. And you'll most likely have that capability also. You'll no longer be made a little lower than the angels. See right now, you know, you're lower than the angels in the sense that you can't do what they can do with all that stuff. But you're going to be a part of a group of people that are superior, superior in power to the cherubim and the seraphim, the archangels and the normal angels and the unclean spirits and Satan himself. Why do you think the devil hates you so much? You're going to be superior in power, even to him and all the other heavenly creatures. Because we're going to be changed. and We're not only going to be changed at the rapture, we're going to be caught up. So we're changed in a moment and a twinkling of an eye. Our bodies change and we're caught up. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Once again, he talks about them which are asleep. And this is the people in Christ who have already died. And he says, sorrow not. We're not, we're not like lost people who have no hope of ever seeing our dead loved ones again. And he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. I believe. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and he was buried and resurrected. And I, that's what I put my trust in. I believe he paid my sin debt on the cross and I accepted his payment. And if you have believed that, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and your dead loved ones, have, have believed on Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to be reunited with them. It says, even so them also which sleep in Jesus were God to bring with him. And that's Jesus bringing the souls of believers who have already went on. He's bringing them back with him at the rapture. And it says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That would be like if the rapture happened right now, you would be part of that, part of those who are alive and remain. 
And it says you're not going to prevent them. You're not going to prevent them which are asleep. The asleep are the dead saints. And the prevent means like to go before. Like pre-event. You're not going to go up before the, the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ are actually going to rise, rise up first. They're going to be caught up first. And it says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. John was taken forward in time in Revelation 4. He saw the rapture of the church. He hears that voice. That sounds like a trumpet. In Revelation 4.1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So the voice at the rapture, the Lord's voice is going to say, Come up hither. And it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So you're changed and you're caught up. You're caught up together with the dead in Christ and the clouds. They've got a new body. They're no longer the dead in Christ. They've got their new body that's going to live forever. And we meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the dead in Christ rise first, and we're caught up together with them in the clouds. At this time, our bodies are changed, and we are caught up. And it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It is a comfort to know you're going to see your saved loved ones again and that you will not be going through the future tribulation time period. So you're going to be changed. You're going to be caught up. And then, hopefully, you're going to be crowned. Sometime after the rapture, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm not sure of the exact time that the judgment takes place, but I believe it will be while the tribulation is taking place on earth. Some people don't believe it takes place during that time, but rather after. They believe that the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place right before the millennium. And, I mean, it's that's fine wherever you want to put it, but I, I believe that it's taking place while the tribulation is going on. And we're going to be judged there about our service for the Lord. And this isn't about whether or not you're you're going to heaven or hell. That's already been decided when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not what this judgment is about. But it says in Romans 14, 10 through 12, it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. A lot of people accuse me of believing that we can just live however we want to live. We're saved by believing. We're saved by, you know, by grace through faith. We're not saved by works. And they say, well, since you believe that, you believe you can just live however you want to live. That couldn't be any further from the truth. We can't lose our salvation, but every one of us shall give account of himself to God. What you do matters. It says in 1 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. What are you doing in your body? Remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What are you doing in it? Everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Then 1 Corinthians 3, 8, it says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Are you laboring for the Lord? That's what this is about. And if you're doing good works with the right motive, then you're going to receive a re reward. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building." According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, 
Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What sort is it? Did you do it with the right motive? Or were you doing it for yourself? But see, your foundation, your foundation is Jesus Christ. The moment you got saved, you got a foundation. From that t point on, you began building your building that you're going to present to God at the judgment seat of Christ. And you've either been building with gold, silver, or precious stones, or you've been building with wood, hay, and stubble. He's going to put that building through the fire, and whatever makes it out on the other side is your reward. The rest is just going to be burned up. So what are you building your building with? Are you working for the Lord? Are you doing that work with the right motive? Those are the things that's going to make it through the fire. And there will, of course, be people who do not get crowned and that don't get rewards. They're going to be changed. They're going to be caught up. But they're going to be crownless at the judgment seat of Christ. You want a crown. It says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built their own, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work abide, which he hath built their own. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You see, it's his works that got burned up, not him. It's, he's saved, yet so as by fire, and that the fire never touches him. It's the works that go through the fire. But you want to have works that are going to make it through the fire. You want your building, that you're building for the Lord, to make it through the fire. That way you can be crowned. And this is every Christian's future. And of course, after the judgment seat of Christ, you're crowned. Then we're going to go into the millennial kingdom. You see, the Lord uh, came, we came down with the Lord in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God at the second coming. And he's going to set up his kingdom. We're going to go into his kingdom and crowns are for kings. So if you're being crowned, he's going to be giving you rulership over places in his kingdom. And you're going to rule with him. The saints are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So you want to be crowned. You're going to be changed. You're going to call up. And then you're going to be crowned, hopefully. But this is, I'm going to end the uh, series with this, the Christians in Times Manual Part 2, only two parts. The last one, if you want to look at it, was the Latter-day Saints about how it certainly looks like we're in the latter days for the church age right now. So go back and watch that one if you already didn't, and then think about this one. What are you doing with your time that's remaining? Because this is coming. It may sound like some type of fantasy, but it's not a fantasy. It's really going to take place. We're going to be changed, caught up, and then crowned.